Sometimes I want to float away, fly away and close my eyes. Good morning. And again, I'm coming to you from my office here. Don't know how long we will continue in the uh, state we're in. Uh, we're recording this on a Thursday afternoon, Thursday evening, and I know that tomorrow the governor is supposed to give out a new order, give out new directives to know some things, so we don't know how long that will be coming this way. But there is two things that we do know. We want to get back together as soon as we can, but as soon as it's safe. The other thing is that we want to be overly cautious. Again, we care about each other. And we want to make sure that we don't jump the gun, that we don't do something. So we'll keep going like this until we determine that it's safe for us to all be back, whatever form that will be, in our auditorium. It's also good to be together and, and, and I'll be here this week. Um, you know, my, part of my body was missing last week and it's, it's good to have that back. We were talking about the body. And, and last week we used that to talk about that we're sinners. In the body of Christ, we are sinners and we need to grasp that. We need to grasp that because if we don't realize that, if we don't understand that we are sinners, that we are separated from God, then the sacrifice that we need to grasp really doesn't mean anything to us. If you don't realize you need that, then you're not going to realize you'd have to have it. So that sacrifice, and if we don't do that, then we don't grasp what the salvation is all about. We, we talked about those three points last week. This week, I want to talk about four of the points. Four points... When it comes to once we've grasped that, we need to guard that. Paul, in the two letters he writes to the young evangelist Timothy, talks to him about this four different times. I want to read one of them. I'm going to read from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Paul writes to him, What you have heard from me keep as a pattern of sound teaching, with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit." That was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. He's talking about the teaching that he had, the sound teaching. He's talking about God's word. To, to Timothy, that meant the Old Testament. That meant the apostles' teaching. It meant what was being revealed to them right then and there. For us, it is still the Old Testament. It is the apostles' teaching. It's what others were inspired by God to write in what we call the Bible. So he's telling him, guard the good teaching. Guard this. Make sure you know what this says. He goes on then, and he says, with faith and love. I love how that's mixed in here because knowledge is useful, but it's, it's really not what we need if we don't have the faith of an understanding of God's love for us when we look at the knowledge, when we look at what the words say. He also says, guarded, finally, with the Holy Spirit. That was entrusted in you. We have the Holy Spirit. We have God's Spirit living in us, helping us as we go forward. The power of God. And that's maybe for another time to talk about just how powerful God's Spirit is living in us. And what a privilege it is to have God reside in us through His Spirit. That's how important we are to Him. So guard it with these things. With that in mind, I want to look at four aspects, four places that we need to deal with guarding what we've grasped. The first is we need to guard it against society. It was something that's always been dealt with. Over in Galatians chapter 2, I want to read verses 12 and 13. This is Paul writing to the churches in Galatia. It says, Before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined in him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. This is written to the churches in Galatia, what we call Asia Minor then, now we'd call it Central Turkey. If you look at the map that we've got pulled up, you can kind of see the area there that would be Galatia. Okay, kind of Central Turkey now. Paul had a very special place in his heart for these individuals. On his first missionary journey, this is where he went. 
This is where he went and preached, established Christ as Lord and Savior in this area to him. Then on the second and third, which would be the blue and the pink, if you're looking at the map, we see he went through there two more times to talk to them. This was a very special collection of people, collection of congregations that Paul knew about. See, he and Barnabas had established these congregations. And what's interesting is Peter caved to society. Peter caved on a whole Jew-Gentile issue, so much so that Barnabas was led astray. This whole Jew-Gentile issue, it, it, it was huge back then. I'm, I'm trying to think of a way to explain it. We can never get an exact uh, replica or something like that, but, but the best one I could come up with is let's say that someone from that state just south of us, we don't need to mention what it is, they wanted to move up here and become one of us. Well, we said, okay, well, in order to do that, you have got to go to the big house, stand on the 50-yard line, sing Hail to the Victors, and shout, Woody who? Only after doing that could you legally become a Michigander. That's kind of what it was like, though it was even stronger than that. Peter, in Acts chapter 10, is who went to the Gentiles and allowed them, through the power of God, to accept Christ without becoming Jews first. Then he went back and he explained to the Jews that this was okay. Pressure from society has an effect on us. It may be overt, it may be more subtle. Hollywood has a big effect on our lives, whether we want to accept it or not. I, I think that there's a show out right now called God Friended Me. And it's about someone that gets texts from God and with his friends, they, they, they do good things for God. A few years back, it was Joan of Arcadia. You want to go even further back, there was a movie called Oh God with John Denver in it. See, what that was was Hollywood saying what they think God should be like. And then putting that forth. And we see that stuff and we accept it. We think, oh, it just gets in our brain that that's what it is. So we've got to be careful. Society, maybe overtly or subtly, gives us the idea of what God should be rather than us going back to his word. Plus with society, it's always changing. I don't know why, but it's always changing. And we, we accept that. Some of it, and some of it we don't like as much. But to show how it's always changing is movies. You, you remember movies, you'd, you'd go, you'd, you'd pay money to go and sit in this comfortable reclining chair that, you know, popped, feet up, and in front of you was this three-story screen that, that they would project stuff on, and we'd watch, maybe get a big bucket of popcorn with extra butter and eat it. Oh, the good old days. The good old days of a month and a half ago was when we could go to them. But, but looking at movies, the rating criteria, it changes. It changes with society. There was a study done about movies from the, uh, the mid-90s. One that uh, they talked about had an R rating in 1996. In 2003, if that same movie would have been released, it would have had a PG-13 rating. The movie had not changed. The rating system had in just seven years. Well, how did the rating system change? Because the rating system is based on a group of people that sit in a room and determine what is acceptable in society now. Society changes. That's a society we live in. That's a society we work in. That's a society we reach out to in. A society that tries to set the foundation of what God is all about. It tries to interpret God. It tries to tell us what God's ways are. We need to adapt to society as it goes forward, yes, but we need to be in adhering to God's word and God's ways. So we need to be guarding against society. Second thing we need to be guarding against is scheduling. What things do we schedule to do at times when the body comes together? Last week we, we talked about, it's not about attendance. 
It's not. It's about salvation. But if you don't clock in 77% of the time that the church is scheduled to meet together on a Sunday morning, you lose your salvation. Yeah? It's, it's based on the fact that how many years did the Israelites wander in the desert? 40 years. One day for every year they wandered in the desert. Because if you do the math, 77% of 52 is 40. Is that just a coincidence? Moses was up on the mount for 40 days getting the Ten Commandments. The spies, when they came to land, for 40 days they spied out the land. Noah, how long did it rain? 40 days. Jesus fasted at the start of his ministry. How long? 40 days. Plus seven. Well, seven is just a magical number. It's, it's Father, Son, Holy Spirit, so there's three. North, south, east, and west. Three plus four is seven. That's completeness. So we see that seven, seven is double completeness. So if you are not in attendance at least 70% of the time, you lose your salvation. Some of you are wondering, is that true? Others are wondering, we need to shut this guy up because he's spewing nonsense. No, it's not true. There's no clocking in that saves you. But the idea of why we come together. We need to be coming together, adhering to God's word, not some fine-sounding argument and some great numbers that I just put forth. It goes back to society. The idea of society tries to tell us, tries to tell us what God is all about. No, there's no physical clocking in that needs to take place. But there is something here. It's spiritual and it's eternal. Is following God, following Jesus important? Yeah, we would, we would say that is. Is following his body important? Well, yeah. Do we show it? A family comes together on Sunday morning. If you're not here, your kids see that. See, we can say what we want about how important things are, but how we live our life, what we schedule in our life, tells more than our words. People see our lives. I want to read a couple passages that I like. The first one is from 1 John. 1 John chapter 3, verse 18. Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. Without words or tongue, with action, our actions show where our heart is. Over in James, chapter 2, verse 18, James writes something very similar here. He says, But someone will say, You have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. It's important for people to see what is important to you. And that is our schedule. Are we scheduling God out of our lives? What kind of example are we giving to our kids? We need to look at this from a body's perspective also. All right? Why do we meet Wednesday at 9 a.m.? You're going, we don't meet Wednesday at 9 a.m. No, we meet Wednesday evening because that is best for people. We have to work. Okay. Sunday morning, we're not working at 4 a.m. Why don't we meet then? Well, because that's not the best time for it. Why do we meet at 10.30? So see, we need to take a look at that too. But more on that next week, we look at adhering versus adapting. The schedule. It is seen by your kids. It is seen by others. What do they see? We'll come back to kind of that concept in a minute when we talk about some distractions of sorts. But next, we need to guard against stupidity. I know, I know, if your kids are watching, you can turn and say, we don't say stupidity. I actually used the word stupid in a sermon once, and a mother who had young kids in there came up and talked to me afterwards and said, uh, we don't use stupid in our family. 
I went and I apologized to the kids. My point was still the same. But I went and apologized to the kids because that's what I needed to do there. But if you think about it, if you look at the definition, behavior that shows a lack of good sense or judgment. You gotta kinda agree, that's pretty descriptive of us at times in, in life and in following Christ. Outside of eternal life and love, the, the thing that I really like about the scriptures is the people in it. Because when I look at them, I, I, I don't feel so bad, be it Old Testament or New Testament. I mean, think about Peter. What we just looked at earlier when Paul had to call him on the carpet for backing up from the Gentiles and just hanging out with the Jews. Okay. Simon, a sorcerer in Acts chapter 8. He's baptized, he receives the Holy Spirit, and then he foolishly asked the apostles, he said, can you give me the ability to do that? I will pay you big bucks. And in Acts chapter 8, verse 18 and 19, I love it here, it says, When Simon saw that the Spirit was given on the laying on of hands, the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Man, he saw a cash cow. I, I think stupidity would fit here. Okay? If you think about it, lack of good judgment, lack of sense, yeah. Peter kind of just lays it straight out. And I like picking it up in verse 24. Then Simon answered, Pray to the Lord for me, so that nothing you have said may happen to me. See, he, he, he got it. He realized what it was all about. He realized he had done something stupid. See, we do that. I, I love the book of Judges. Anybody that thinks the Old Testament is about God's wrath and war, and then the New Testament is all about love, they haven't read the Old Testament very well. The book of Judges, what I love about it, they mess up. Things are going along just great. God, yay, praise God and everything. And then they kind of forget about God. And they stop doing things God's way. And then all of a sudden, a nation comes in, raiding parties come in, and they raid their land, and they're in trouble. And they cry, God, help us! And what does God do? You foolish people. No. He comes and he helps them. He sends them deliverers, judges. They lead the people out. And they again are doing well. And then they forget about God down the road. Another generation comes. God, help us! He's there for them again and again and again. See, I see God's love and grace again and again in the Old Testament. The God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament. His love, His mercy is in both places. One last place I want to stop here in the Old Testament is in 1 Kings chapter 11. 1 Kings chapter 11. I want to read verse 4 there. 1 Kings 11, verse 4. This is about Solomon, okay? The wisest man in the whole world. Biblically, it says that. Even sources outside the Bible claim of his wisdom. All this wisdom he had. And here we go. 1 Kings 11, verse 4. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord, his God, as the heart of David, his father, had been. All this wisdom. And his heart was turned away from God. Will he be in heaven? I don't know. You read this, you'd say, eh. You read the end of Ecclesiastes, and it's to know God. We don't know. I do know that in all the times in the New Testament, when it is talking about the heroes of the faith, he is not mentioned. The roll call of faith, as it's called in Hebrew 11, Solomon is not mentioned. I don't know. It's not mine to call. But I do know this. We need to guard against being stupid and following the ways of this world. See, he did not guard against it. And they slowly eroded away his faith. We need to do that. And finally, kind of all comes together, we need to guard against Satan. I've been reading Job 
in my daily Bible reading. And it's not one of my, my favorite books. It's allegory. Is it true? It's hard to tell, but I, I like more of the action books when things happen where this is some guys sit around talking, and then God comes and talks to them. There's, there's value in it, don't get me wrong. But there's one passage here that's kind of interesting. Don't understand everything about this, but I want to read this. In Job chapter 1, verse 7, The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. So we need to be on our guard against Satan. Don't understand how Satan's roaming through the earth. Don't understand that. I'm not going to take that farther than it says right here. But I think we can all agree we need to be aware of Satan. We cannot lose sight of him. Last week, I mentioned a basketball analogy. I'll bring another one up. I like basketball. I like sports. Let's say you're playing a team that's got a tremendous three-point shooter. He hit 60% of his shots. Are you going to leave him alone? Are you going to forget about him out on the court? No. You're going to guard him continuously. You're going to always know where he is. You're going to be aware of where he is. You're going to double team him at times. See, we need to be aware of Satan. Because he'll bury that three-pointer. The dagger. That will make us lose. In our relationship with God. He will if we're not aware of it. He will if we don't keep our guard up. And I say you may double team. That's again the body coming together. Sometimes we need to get with each other to help us. To deal against Satan. To deal against the things that we deal with. So we need to guard against stupidity. The good sense and the judgment. Because Satan will come along and he'll mess that up. He did with Solomon. Wisest man to live. We need to guard against scheduling. Satan wants us busy. Wants us so busy that we slowly schedule God out of our lives. Slowly. It's not a 90 degree turn, a 180 degree turn from God, but slowly things will happen and this will happen. And before you know it, God is slowly edged out of our life. The body is slowly edged out of our life. We need to guard against society. Satan using society to change, to make us think, oh, that's okay. Oh, don't worry. We need to understand God. We need to understand God's love from the scriptures, not from the world. So we need to grasp that love that God has for us. That's what it's all about. We talked about that last week with the sacrifice. We need to guard against that in every way so that we don't lose the understanding of that love. We don't lose the focus on that. It's hard. Sometimes we're going to lack proper judgment. I do that at times. I make mistakes. God's love is there regardless. Think of Simon the sorcerer. Give me money so that I can have the power and I can be the richest, most powerful man in the area. Peter says, you're going to rot along with your wealth. What does he say? Please pray that it doesn't happen. He turned back around. So we're going to have lack of judgment at times. Turn to God. Continue to focus on God. We need to make the right choices. Because culture is there trying to influence it and make us turn away from God. It's hard. That's why we come together. Not to punch a clock, not to make the 77% threshold, which I still think is pretty good. But we come together to stay strong. We come together to encourage one another. We come together to love each other. As individuals, that's difficult. As a body, that's difficult. See, our culture is always changing. How do we change with the culture but not lose sight of God's word? How do we keep up with the culture we're in, the society we're in, but not fall away from God? We're going to talk about that some next week when we look at adapting versus adhering. Stay safe. I love you.